Okay, let's start. Good afternoon and welcome to the third chapter by now of Crisis Imaginaries. And it is again a rainy day in Amsterdam. And I realize I keep saying that in my introduction because it rains a lot in Amsterdam, but the heat wave was here as well. And I heard there's some thought given now about giving heat wave names as well, which is interesting in regards to this topic in terms of creating an emotional report response to climate crisis events. So uh, my name is Sophia. I'm currently on Ehrechacht at the Goethe Institute Amsterdam, where I work as a program curator. And this program is a collaboration between us and Framer Framed. Framer Framed is a platform for contemporary art, visual culture, and critical theory and practice in the east of Amsterdam. They present a variety of exhibitions in collaboration with curators and artists, as well as an extensive public program. And their next exhibi exhibition from what we will reassemble ourselves will start next week on the 6th of September. And I am personally very excited about this and recommend everyone to see it. All right, I haven't seen it yet, obviously. The Goethe Institute is the German Cultural Institute with a global reach and our cultural and educational programs encourage intercultural dialogue and enable cultural involvement. Um, thank you, Framer Frame, for this collaboration. So to begin with, just a very few words about the serious crisis imaginaries. So the idea of having a program that takes its starting point from the current COVID-19 crisis and draws attention to the other crisis, the climate catastrophe, was born of a sense of urgency. All of a sudden, we were able to experience what is actually possible when crisis is happening in front of our eyes. And now we have gotten more used to it obviously. So the embodied experience of the crisis is also the starting point for this third chapter of day, climate feelings. Why feelings? Well, we know that climate change is much more than hard science. It is a social phenomenon intertwined with human emotion. Every action, every word, every personal and political decision about the climate is directed, influenced and controlled by our emotional response to it. Everyone who has grieved the loss of a beloved person, space or life, knows that the pain of this experience includes the realization that a future, once envisioned with a loved one, is no longer within the potential of reality anymore. And that hurts a lot. Why are we then not continuously and publicly mourning the loss we experience through the climate catastrophe? And on the other hand, is there room for positivity amidst the sense of dread? Fear, anger, passion, and grief can be powerful tools for navigating change. So today, we will turn towards our anxiety and despair, but also to hope. We ask, how do the effective impacts of the climate crisis sit within our bodies? And how can we navigate them as activists, artists, as individuals and collectives? And we have brought together wonderful people from very different backgrounds. Uh, and before they get introduced and start actually the conversation, I will just take the chance to introduce our moderator, Binna Choi. So Binna is the director of the Casco Art Institute, working for the Commons in Utrecht, where she engages with both its artistic program and the organizational and deinstituting practice as her curatorial and collaborative art practice. In doing so, the comments are both an end goal in systemic change and methodology, methodology, by which she means equal, loving, and sustainable modes of caring and sharing common resources. And before I really finally give the word to Binna, I would already like to invite everyone to join us also for the fourth chapter of the series on the 22nd of September. Uh, please check our website and social media for more info about that, or you just come back to this YouTube channel where it will be live streamed as well. But for today, we talk about climate feelings and please Binna, the stage is yours, take over. Okay, uh, so hi everyone, good afternoon. Um, although I don't see you, very nice to uh, share this space together in this afternoon for uh, coming two hours. Um, 
yeah, we are on many mixed feeling. And uh, when I uh, decided to take on this uh, moderating responsibility, there was something that kind of, you know, like looming that like, what does it mean to talk about feeling? Uh, and I think in, um, there is this kind of sense that feeling is kind of frivolous or moody, um, you know, something separated or separated from or inferior to like knowledge. So like talking about feeling in like publicly shared space, um, uh, yeah, it's like a careful job, it felt. But then, uh, as also Sophia mentioned, um, I think when we uh, uh, when we are dealing with climate, actually feelings is like very crucial barometer, or it could be even like where the agency could uh, begin uh, from. And um, I'm South Korean <laughs> by nationality and, and South, uh, Korean language is my mother tongue. In fact, in Korean and Chinese language, uh, the climate and mood and the disposition like temperament and characteristic all share the same word. So climate is kihu and um, disposition is kiji and the feeling is kibun. So here the key is crucial, and this means kind of materialistic uh, energy. So I felt like this is what we are dealing with today, <laughs> transmitted through this uh, digital space. Um, so um, uh, as way to introduce the discussion today and then the panel, I thought um, I'd like to trace kind of my, my emotional journey um, um, or journey with uh, climate feeling. So that uh, I would say begins with a sense of urgency or a feeling that Ooh, I really have to do something more explicit and pervasive uh, through uh, what I do. And that feeling of urgency, uh, in fact, was not so long ago. <laughs> That's maybe another doubt that I had in taking up this uh, 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 responsibility, but maybe because of that, it's more relevant. So it's only two years ago. So January, 2019, I think many uh, others, uh, I saw this speech by Greta Thunberg at the uh, World Economic Forum in Davos. And that speech was titled like, our house is on fire. And she was saying that like the adult, uh, like she speak as a teenager that we don't want your hope. We don't want you to be hopeful, but uh, we want you to be, or I want you to be in panic as if our house is on fire. And uh, um, yeah, that really have, has awakened me. <laughs> um, um, so uh, together with uh, my colleagues who's, uh, uh, who's part of the steering committee for the annual assembly uh, we are organizing as CASCO. Um, so Aneta Krauss, Yolandi van der Heide in Kwe, we decided that we're going to dedicate the upcoming assembly in that year, 2019, to the climate crisis. So assembly is, uh, where we open institutional policy or institutional agenda to the public and to our close community by uh, gathering and discussing uh, and making decision and working together. Um, so that decision was made, you know, from uh, 
I have to mention that uh, from perspective of commoning or the commons, here we uh, use this notion to refer to um, uh, no, sharing, caring, caring and sharing the vital uh, resource. Um, um, we cannot but consider like planet or planetary commons, which offers you know abundance of resource um, without boundary like property but um, human has been extracting and then um, extracting digging and overusing and we all know there is uh, we all know uh, maybe we don't sense that there is a dis depletion of resource, uh, resource. So it is fundamental for dealing with, uh, uh, yeah, climate crisis. Uh, 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 it's like fundamental basis for practice uh, of the commons. Um, so that was a January and decision was made uh, in following months. And uh, in that month, uh, there's another awakening or another learning curve. Uh, then it's about actually um, grief, uh, mourning, uh, and anger. So uh, that comes with question about this title or this statement that our house is on fire. So uh, learning has been, in fact, our house has been on fire for 500 years. So that's kind of, that's the, I think, phrase that has been repeated uh, um, again and again during the assembly. So this is what um, indigenous community since the colonization uh, has been in intergenerational, multi-generational uh, struggle. Um, and then now Wes is waking up and I was waking up. So that meant like from a notion of climate crisis that we start engaging with climate justice. So it's in fact the most minor, most vulnerable uh, those in uh, former colony uh, the poor uh, uh, is that the or they least is responsible for climate crisis, but most affected. Uh, so uh, we had artists uh, Ama Josephine Budge and also climate activist Susan Daliwar, and then also uh, members from the Network Arts Collaboratory to talk about this climate justice issue. And there are a lot of grief. Uh, uh, or a lot of matters that we felt grief uh, about. Um, so this grief that um, paired with anger then uh, came down to <laughs> finally a sense of depression, um, um, you know, like pandemic outbreak. Uh, and we are still uh, under a pandemic that seems to be endless. Um, mm, yeah, with, with the pandemic, um, we finally, I think, got this, uh, like what otherwise seemed to be like cinematic uh, crisis imaginary, you know, like deserted uh, street where commerce uh, stop uh, real in, in, in our neighborhood. Um, uh, in our everyday needs. And there definitely, I think, kind of mainstreaming of the sense that, oh, like mainstreaming the sense of the necessity of paradigm shift or systemic change. But uh, this continuously followed, uh, followed, uh, follow, followed by the news on wildfire uh, that already began at the end of 2019 in Australia and now in California. And uh, I think it's still going on in Siberia. 
uh, Amazon, uh, etc., and then um, uh, permafrost in Siberia is melt, uh, melting, and Siberia had like most high temperature uh, last year. Uh, yeah, flooding and drought. We are inundated with this news and. Uh, uh, within the condition that, uh, yeah, like my governance around the world. Um, bad news, <laughs> um, many bad news. Um, um, so, uh, but what is interesting here, <laughs> and despite of this bad news, uh, this um, a sense of uh, ongoing or imminent like depression uh, doesn't stay as they are uh, to lead to uh, certain action um, um, uh, that are necessary. So uh, there is always this kind of mixed feeling that, oh, I should do something more or beyond my, my boundary. Uh, um, uh, yeah. So like never, never feels enough, but at the same time, uh, just not doing it. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, I addressed before their sense of despair, but also uh, hope and pessimism versus uh, optimism. Um, and maybe it's most important for us to uh, speak uh, or uh, like uh, sharing this space. Uh, there is uh, like this sense of like every day going on, kind of business as usual. Uh, maybe it's like a uh, certain uh, necessary bracket that we have for uh, uh, living, surviving and doing things. But this business as usual, um, certain like banality of it also creeping into uh, this uh, emotional sphere. So some uh, psychologists call this as a double bind and it seems like this double bind of mix or oppositional feeling is quite present also dealing with climate uh, uh, crisis. So, um, yeah. So my uh, proposal for the round table um, and presentation is that we focus on this complex feeling or uh, double bind, and also not to forget uh, some of us uh, speaking from a space of privilege. I can speak about it and there are many who cannot speak and who cannot even uh, listen uh, through, yeah, like direct and severe impact of climate crisis. Um, uh, so my proposal is to uh, focus on this emotional sphere as uh, a space that led uh, uh, for uh, amazing artists that we have here uh, uh, take on and, uh, their work and continue on their practice. Um, so now the introduction to the speakers. Uh, we have a four uh, artists. So unlike other two panels, uh, all our uh, speakers here are artists, but all from different places, uh, far and close from um, Amsterdam, where I'm speaking now. And I start uh, to introduce them in the order they're going to uh, speak. So uh, first we have a Clementine Edwards, uh, artist uh, from Melbourne, uh, Australia, which she rectified as NARM, um, which is the, I believe the language, the name of Melbourne in indigenous language. And she's alumni of the Chart Institute and now living in Rotterdam. In 2019, so last year she had 
uh, solo show in road capture, uh, which is very app um, uh, uh, with a title that is very app called Mood Rings. Mood Ring? Yeah, Mood Ring. <laughs> and, and last year, she also joined the working group or temporary collective from this uh, assembly uh, of the Climate Justice Code writing and disseminating for artists and art institution. It's work in progress. And um, yeah, her practice follow, her practice informed by sculpture, uh, follow her ongoing research line on what Clementine calls material kinship um, beyond biological or normative relationship in the context of po post-traumatic stress. Uh, in particular under or from so-called Australia as the uh, settler colonial state. And um, artists who follow is Ada M. Patterson. Um, they, so they use pronoun they uh, uh, from uh, uh, Bridgetown, Barbado, the most Eastern island of Caribbean region um, uh, and alternate between London and Bridgetown and Rotterdam, where they were the resident artists of the Hamburger community of art in Rotterdam. And they are also writer and educator. And at this moment, uh, there is a show by them, by Ada, uh, at Tent in Rotterdam that goes until 27 September is Again, with very apt title, relevant title for us, uh, 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 which is the whole world is turning. And uh, I'd like to read um, the part of the introduction, which would be our introduction, uh, which is as the impact of climate change touches bodies across the globe in different ways, how can we feel each other's hurt? grieve each other's losses, losses, and speak to what is happening and what do we want from each other after sharing our experience of crisis. And then I move to introduce Alini Bayana, uh, who's speaking from now Berlin, uh, where I believe she's preparing for upcoming Berlin Biennale opening in a week, um, and uh, but Alini is from Salvador Bahia of Brazil, uh, but she uh, alternate between uh, Rio and Berlin. Um, uh, she has been organizing. I mean, um, besides many. Um, uh, uh, presentation exhibition in the field of art. She has been also uh, organizing um, outside of contemporary art like uh, uh, Abri Indigena, annual event for indigenous right, uh, indigenous people's right in Brazil uh, and Film Ambient, which is the environmental international film festival in Rio. Uh, working with various media. And then I quote here, um, uh, she's focusing on ontological conflict uh, in convergence with indigenous, feminist, ethnic, environmental, and social justice studies uh, through her work on focusing on uncovering other history, both within and against hegemonic powers of colonial rule. And the last uh, speaker would be Tar Bury, uh, artist from New York. Uh, but you, uh, he was in Amsterdam 2018, which I could trace <laughs> uh, to give lectures and workshop in different universities uh, for his uh, organizing institute, institute, institute <laughs> organizing institute. Uh, and pedagogy practice as uh, integral or as, as uh, artistic practice. So there are many impressive lists of this uh, organization or organizational artistic uh, work 
by Tao, uh, including uh, Echo Practicium, uh, artist run school for ecological justice, uh, Occupy Museums, um, very well known, and then um, uh, School of Apocalypse, which is that examining the connection between creative practice and notion of survivor. So this is my intro. And now I'd like to give floor to Clementine. Thank you, Vina. Hi, everyone on the panel and watching streaming now or later. Um, yeah, when you were talking, Vina, I was just thinking you mentioned uh, psychology. <laughs> and um, I, it had me thinking about something my psychologist said to me many years ago uh, and she's like um, this is in relation to uh, yeah the complexity of psychological internal life and she's like um, you know you have the anxiety and then you have the anxiety about being anxious you know you become anxious about being anxious or like depressed about being depressed or grieve about grieving. And I guess today I'm interested and exciting, excited to be talking with you all about like, not the comp, oh, I mean, like, it's always going to be complicated, but to see if we can get to this spot in between in the middle. Uh, I know I probably can't. <laughs> but I, I will try. Um, I, I guess for me uh, to talk about my um, relationship to and feelings around climate crisis and how to how I um, put those feelings to work in like a really very small way. Um, first, I wanted to talk to you about um, like I need to situate myself, who I am, um, and why I might be understood as a subject and not as an object or a non-subject. Um, and therefore why I have a voice now talking to you, but in general, why my feelings are attributed, uh, my story or my human humanity is assigned. Um, yeah, so I need to address where I am and why I am before I can talk about how I am. Um, so maybe this is elaborate complication or white settler colonial guilt, uh, but I've got to do it. Um, so I first want to start by situating my feelings in the context of climate colonialism, uh, something that I've learnt. Um, like you've been right, I came kind of awake to this, uh, the structures of uh, climate crisis and how they're um, enmeshed and bound up in structures of colonial uh, expansion and extraction and empire. I came to this realisation uh, quite recently, um, last year, but um, by, uh, oh yeah, and I wanted to say also uh, to situate my feelings, not to devalidate my feelings, but to uh, deepen my capacity to attend to my feelings because I've contextualized them. And that feels kind of important. Um, yeah, so I, I'm, I understand the climate crisis now as a later chapter in the colonial project. And because of that, I need to talk about the colonial project before I can talk about my feelings. <laughs> um, I am indeed born in the country known as Australia um, and have been educated in the Netherlands. And so I find my feet um, firmly planted between two major perpetrators of colonial knowledge production. Um, my mode of sense making is enclosed within um, this subjective universe of like European colonial power. Um, and uh, this world is where the notion of rationality was born. Um, and European modernity or rationality, yet yeah, was constituted right where I am now in kind of Western Europe. Um, so I guess one example would be like my own relevant kind of deep biographical uh, example, which is as a white Australian, I live on a landmass that was invaded by the English in 1788. Um, so the example of Australia existing as a concept is predicated on uh, this idea of terra nullius, which is uh, means like empty land. The English literally declared this over 
and across the land. Uh, so this is to say that it's built on the denial of Aboriginal people's existence in Australia. Um, so uh, yeah, the English at the point of invasion and actually since that point and up until today, uh, the English morphing into the Australian state um, have been uh, not just interested in the dispossession of Indigenous people, but interested in their total annihilation. So the dis total destruction of their worlds, which looks very different in different regions, but this includes dispossession, which is something that ongo is ongoing until today. Um, and I say all of this because I want to kind of um, be able to understand my existence as a white Australian um, as yeah, as predicated on this on this dispossession. And so my humanity is attributed because other peoples have been denied, basically. Um, so this global heating caused by fossil fuel emissions from mining, et cetera, would follow on from the early extraction and destruction of ecosystems and introduction of uh, disease and pests and invasive plant life. Um, uh, but I would, I would like to propose that this point of invasion was like an early example of climate crisis for the Indigenous and that in fact was an end of worlds moment. I mean, the worlds continue in various different like strong and incredible ways, but that's a, that's a turning point moment and that's certainly a moment that I have um, benefited from in an ongoing way. Um, and so... Uh, oh, yeah... Um, I talk about this Eurocentered thing because I guess I want to under, invite you to understand the way in which I talk and my free access to the English language and my ability to move around unpoliced and my ability to speak and often be heard without being seen as a representative of all white women, for instance. All of this is in part a result of my accrued privileges uh, of being a white Australian, living in a European co country that sees and supports my uh, my existence. Um, and this kind of goes back a little bit to what Bina was saying about uh, kind of her waking up or her um, awakening, yeah, um, last year. And I guess I've been thinking a lot about um, at what point does a crisis touch you? And um, did it visit you recently? Um, have you known the climate crisis intergenerationally? Um, and how does that temporality of crisis speak to your own implication, actually? So I've been thinking, reflecting personally, because my awakening in like a, uh, I mean, I've had like multiple through my life, but kind of feeling like I needed to uh, uh, direct energies towards, direct emotions towards um, action also occurred kind of through uh, a couple of different points last year and this year. Um, particularly in relation to the landmass that I'm from burning, uh, catastrophic fires, and um, led me to kind of think th through what I'm going to do with these feelings. Um, I guess, um, mm, yeah, so I guess I'd call it like a radicalisation of thinking and um, this connecting climate crisis to this destruction um, that's kind of sprung from colonialism for me has it occurred has occurred in two phases most recently yes the bushfires um, and last year actually at Casco's climate justice quote no at Casco's general assembly hearing an artist and writer and activist uh, called Ama Josephine Budge speak about climate colonialism kind of really put a bonfire under me and just kind of it was like one of those cartoon moments where like the saucepan smashes your heads and you have birds like it's like what the fuck no hang on it's not that it's just I just felt like I've been smashed over the head with this realization of my own implication but this kind of Im embedded intergenerational implication and this uh emotion implication isn't an emotion I guess behind that there's guilt and um I can know guilt is the prominent one that stands for me now. Uh, 
the need to put that to work, I guess. Um, and I guess I also wanted to say, although like my entire introduction has been like this elaborate excuse, I guess, uh, for not wanting to talk about my feelings, <laughs> um, I guess I also wanted to talk about what what one does with like if if one is just waking up to climate crisis just now, if you've had the privilege of only just waking up now or if you have not just woken up but you wake up tomorrow or in fucking three years. Scusi, am I allowed to swear? I don't know. Um, but if, if, if one is waking up now, then what, uh, like, to not make the waking up a thing, like, I don't, like, <laughs> to not complicate it with, like, one's implication, actually to situate it to no one's implication, but also uh, to then work on the crisis at hand or like whatever it is you can do in one small way. I'm not sure if I'm being particularly um, clear. Um, um, uh, yeah, and something I'm interested in talking about today is this idea of like um, emotions, how they're felt in the present and um, or like how they're, they're very like, uh, yeah, that emotions are situating. Um, affect and, ex and emotions are also something that like the rest of you is constantly catching up to, I think. Um, but how we can read our emotions maybe as a sort of like, uh, or how we can, like how we can use the emotions to like, um, reorganize not reorganize history but like um to think through immediacy and action like what what are emotions telling us about the present and what's uh what have they uh masked from us to this point uh i'm not going to go on because i'm a little bit lost now but um i'm excited to be talking with everyone and um i guess i hand over to bina or to ada um i didn't really talk about my emotions or did i it's hard to say we will at some point. You didn't really talk about your artistic practice. I did not. You didn't, you don't want. Mm. Well, sh mm. <laughs> uh, I guess I would say I identify as an artist and the thing that for me is exciting about feeling a point of crisis, for instance, exciting may be the wrong word, but uh, is that like art provides a space to kind of map that out, like to explore the complication and to explore like the poetics or the actions or um, it provides a space to uh, speak actually. I mean, I'm speaking now because I'm an artist, not because I give a shit about the environment, if you get the difference. Um, my art practice, I'm interested in material kinships uh i think i'm going on too long Bina. maybe okay we can move to ada and then again like you to collaborate on a piece called shibofu and maybe ada going to introduce that project as well and you can jump in <laughs> as we discuss <laughs> so ada uh, floor is yours thank you Bina. thank you clem um thanks for having me Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so I'm just going to go straight into telling a story, I guess. Um, yeah, just to show, um, I guess, to, to sort of speak to what Clem said about how does how has crisis touched you, um, or climate crisis specifically. Um, um, what, what did that moment look like, or where were you? Um, and so, like, I remember there being um, kind of like bubblings or like resonances being felt, like pointing to uh, experiences of climate crisis, like uh, uh, at home in Barbados and also in the wider Caribbean region. Um, I mean, from like the point of Hurricane Maria specifically, like, yeah, I remember having friends who had moved to Barbados because their houses had been destroyed. Um, 
And at that point, in that moment, like, of course, I understood, like, it was because of a hurricane. Um, but at that point, it just wasn't, um, we weren't talking about it, like, with words like climate crisis or climate refugee or whatever. Um, and so, like, the language hadn't caught up with the, uh, the truth of the experience. Um, when things started to catch up actually in myself and in my own body um, was uh, the passage of Hurricane Dorian last year um, and kind of seeing how strangely it behaved across the region. Um, and it behaved strangely because it, it, it looked like it, as if it was going to um, devastate Barbados and it didn't at the last minute. Um, and the same cannot be said for um, Abaco, um, Grand Bahama and the Bahamas. Um, yeah, I, I, was, I was still in the Netherlands while Hurricane Doreen uh, was passing. Um, and so it was this weird uh, experience of, yeah, being in contact with, um, with friends who were both in the eye of the storm uh, or on the fringes of the storm or, or friends in a position like mine who were not home, not facing the storm, but looking in uh, from a distance through all the images, all the sort of like catastrophic images that were being shared on social media by friends, family, etc. Um, and so, yeah, it, there was a moment like I, f I felt like a lot of the questions I was asking in my own practice um, and just in living in general, <laughs> um, those questions which I thought were at stake um, suddenly got a lot more complicated or I wouldn't say less at stake, but yeah, probably more at stake um, because of how complicated they got. Um, like to talk about my own practice briefly, um, I guess a sort of underlying question that I'm, or underlying, I guess, issue that I'm trying to address or that I have been trying to address is like, I feel that our uh, vocabularies um, say around identity are not particularly um, like they don't have the capacity to account for the, like the complexity of our experiences and our bodies. Um, and so that's an underlying question, uh, an underlying issue for myself um, and for the work that I'm doing. But when I started to feel something happening, <laughs> like when I was seeing all this devastation happening and while I was like having these sort of close intimate conversations with friends um, at different points in relation to the storm or to the hurricane. Um, yeah, I just remember like there was a bodily feeling, something changing in my own body, which I didn't have words for and I, I guess I still don't have words for. Um, I've been calling it climate queering, but like um, it's yeah, it it just sort of made um, like the thing that became more at stake was the idea that facing climate queered hurricanes, um, facing hurricanes that are now intensified because hurricanes are not unfamiliar presences; they are part of like the kind of Caribbean landscape, so to speak. Um, it's the intensity of the hurricanes now as a result of climate crisis, as a result of like the depletion of the world's resources, as a result of the strain being put on the world um, by certain global powers. <laughs> um, it's all of that strain which is, yeah, which is querying our hurricanes, which is querying our relationship to our hurricanes. Um, our hurricanes are no longer tenable. Um, for the most part, we have the infrastructure to survive, um, but that narrative of being resilient in the Caribbean uh, is kind of 
being hollowed out, like um, some of these hurricanes are not survivable. And we could see with Dorian that some of these hurricanes now can wipe islands away. <laughs> um, and I don't want to focus, I don't want to like visualize too much of the, the destruction. Um, but yeah, it, it was sort of a, it felt like a very kind of terrifying turning point because it feels like every, every hurricane season, it's kind of like Russian roulette, which island will be effaced, erased, um, and drowned. Um, and as someone coming from a very flat island, that terrifies me. <laughs> um, and yeah, like, I guess I could, uh, like why I bring this up is to say, um, in all of that that was happening and also like looking into this from a distance, admittedly, um, like it was very strange to notice that like the conversations that I was having with friends and loved ones, um, these sort of grief filled conversations, um, they were so like strangely intimate, um, so strangely like connecting. Um, and I, and like beyond these conversations as well, like I noticed that like under a sort of climate queered hurricane, that strange new social relations were, uh, were coming to the surface. Um, like to speak about, to speak more about the Bahamas, uh, less of the destruction and more about survival. Um, I remember seeing an article about a man who had uh, managed to survive the hurricane by um, by uh, hiding out in in a mangrove swamp, um, and like yeah, I just found that very interesting. Like because I think in his words he said that it would be safer to stay in the mangrove than to stay in his home, um, and that kind of connection being made like in a moment of crisis, of course, um, did interest me or does interest me like. Um, what are the sort of social expectations, this, um, the, the kind of um, the structures that we've previously relied on, like, like what's happening to those things, like in this space where things are very much destabilized and still destabilizing. Um, I guess I'm like, in a strange way, like I'm excited about the possibilities because especially in the Caribbean, we are kind of caught in certain contracts that render both living and dying kind of meaningless um, from a sort of ne neo-colonial uh, standpoint. Um, whether it's like a sort of in some parts of the region being contracted to be tourist tourism islands in life and then on the other side being sold uh, insurance pr premiums by global north uh, disaster capitalists. Um, both our lives and deaths are profitable to other people. <laughs> and that's what I mean by meaningless. Um, I'm kind of going on a tangent um, in different directions, um, but I guess that just speaks to how complicated things are. Um, yeah, uh, I'll speak briefly on, on, I guess, again, on these sort of strange intimate connections in relation to a work that I've recently made um, with Clementine and a few other friends, uh, Art Ramsey and Maria Walhout, um, uh, Nicole Jordan. Um, yeah, A Ship of Fools. Um, basically, I wanted to really give some attention to, um, yeah, these strange connections that were coming up, like between friends, between loved ones, between uh, across species, ecosystem, whatever. Um, and yeah, like there was another turning point where even though I was like caught up with the hurricanes, caught up with the drowning, the images of, of that, like, uh, when the bushfires fire started happening in Australia, um, I was sort of reminded or I, like, there was a moment of catching myself to realize that we are not the only front line of climate crisis, um, and we never were, um, 
and to see climate crisis manifesting in a different way through rather than through water but through fire um it's sort of uh like sharing experiences with clem um when there was a moment when she was uh grieving during the sort of the mass extinction relate, relating to the bushfires um that kind of realization that uh, each each of us um is experiencing climate crisis from very different means and very different ends um it looks very different but it kind of feels like we're in the same sinking ship together <laughs> um and so yeah a ship of fools was it's a I mean, the result is like important, like the output, I guess, but like it was more so um, what I enjoyed about making it was, yeah, these conversations that I was having with friends. Um, I invited Clementine, Ark and Maria to uh, to write, to find words um, in relation to climate crisis, uh, their experiences of climate crisis. Um, and I tried to carry those words, those feelings through through the body of the work, which I saw as a kind of vessel for voices struggling to speak to these moments. Um, and so, yeah, it's a multi-channel video installation. Um, uh, it's a sort of music video installation, um, but I, with the help of uh, Nicole Jordan and myself playing steel pan as well, uh, we made, we, we turned the, the text into songs. Um, and yeah, kind of as a way to to sort of make a space for this grief um, around like it kind of very much feels like it's already here. We're already like there's already loss um, and it feels like it also doesn't matter um, to the powers that be. Um, it's it's very much like. Uh, yeah, I guess for me, the, the urgency lies in finding ways to grieve ourselves before we go ungrieved. <laughs> um, yeah, and so the work is sort of a vessel for that. Um, also trying to think using music as a, as a means to feel each other's hurt rather than just hear it or read it. Um, and I'm going to stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ada. Um, we can move on to Alini. Uh, and hold on some questions uh, later. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I thought it was going to be hard, but not that hard. <laughs> I already have a lot in my mind and I'm not sure I can organize very well my thoughts. Let's try. Um, I think I'll do like Ada and explain a bit my personal experience coming from Brazil. Uh, I was born and spent my childhood in the beginning of my kids are screaming. I'll close the door one second. I live in a house project and they're all here. <laughs> well, I grew up in Brazil and in the northeast of Brazil, in Bahia to be specific. And when I grew up, the end of 80s and 90s, it was, well, my region, uh, it, there was the shore which is green and you have a semi-arid climate inside and it's known for long severe droughts. And at that time when I was a kid and uh, a bit older, we were known and this had gone forever, just I'm telling the part that I was alive, but it has been gone since ever. Um, people would get, um, they would work in, in, in farms for people that had money. And when the drought came, they would get fired because the farms could not uh, sustain them. And then there would come these state uh, organizations that would recruit them to make uh, infrastructure constructions. Not all of them, of course, most, there was a, a big movement of a sort of exodus to the southeast of Brazil, which is the, and to the center of Brazil. Southeast is the most rich part of Brazil. And there is a lot of prejudice from that area with people that come from the northeast. And now with the knowledge that I have now, I realize it's actually like 
we had climate refugees inside its own country. So we actually, we were building these cities and becoming hard workers in the city, but uh, suffering a lot of prejudice and discrimination. And until today, it's still common. Like for example, uh, I'm Alini Bayana. Bayana means I was born in Bahia. Actually, it's not my name. I assumed this name when I moved to Rio and people start calling me that. Sometimes with good intentions from people that spend vacations in Bahia and liked it, and sometimes with not good intentions. So for example, in Sao Paulo, when someone does something stupid, they say, oh, that's a Baiano, that's someone from Bahia. So that's the relation within the country. And going back to the workers, the ones that did not leave and that would be recruited to the to the infrastructure constructions. This infrastructure actually was being built by the state for, for the farmers and rich people. So they would have uh, structures that would uh, allow them to collect water to maintain themselves. But the people themselves would stay uh, thirsty and hungry and the only option was to continue this kind of work. So I grew up with horrible images of kids starving and all these people covered in dust and open trucks, everybody hanging to go to another region to work. So I guess for that reason, I've always been very engaged in environmental issues since early age. And, and yeah, when I moved to Rio, I studied there and then I did cinema first, that was my first university, and actually it's communication and cinema. And uh, I was very frustrated with the sexism and how hard it is also to produce something when you're not part of the elite because you need a budget. And yeah, so it's possible to do things underground, but you're also always postponing because one of the technicians got a paid job. So it was kind of frustrating me a lot especially the TV works that were actually paying my bills. And I also decided I wanted to do more. I was uh, engaged in a farmer's market and, and producing organic, like sharing organic food. And that was not, didn't feel like it was enough anymore. And I decided that I want to join NGO. So I did join NGO and that coincidentally was the, the year of the Rio Plus 20 which was the meeting of the UN to discuss climate. We had the ECHO 92 in Rio and then Rio plus 20 was then, 20 years after. And because I was in the NGO, I participated in the People's Summit and I could um, get in touch with a sort of activism and a fight for humans' rights and environmental rights in a completely different way than what I was doing in the NGO somehow. And it was also the first year we were fighting for not changing the forest code in Brazil. And unfortunately we lost, <laughs> agribusiness won as usual. And uh, because we were doing that, I was organizing with the volunteers of the NGO to make interventions on the street. And actually that's how I ended up in art school because some friends saw it and they were like, oh, have you thought about studying art? And there was a course called art and politics. So I decided to take that course and that kind of shaped my mind in the way that, yeah, there's also another way to, to produce knowledge and discussions that is not just documentaries because I, I couldn't at that moment produce documentaries. I didn't have, budget or influence somehow to make them happen. And, but I came from photography in cinema, so I could take photographies myself, I could film myself, things, not myself, but I could make video projects and stuff. And that's how I started uh, moving into the arts. And let's see, feelings. I have so much to talk about. Um, So the, the, the climate issue, it's, it's so vast. I would, yeah, one thing I, won't, I don't want to forget to say is that Bina commented on the name of the heat waves and other commented on some hurricanes names. And I was remind, remind, reminding myself of a text wrote by a Brazilian poet. I forgot her name, I'm sorry. 
that she was commenting on the fact that the hurricanes got the name of women. It's because it started a tradition when the first guy uh, paid homage to a dear person. And then it became, they started giving female names to the hurricanes. But then studies shown that when the name was feminine, people would fear less the hurricane and prepare less. So the consequences were harder. So how crazy it is that misogyny is in everything, no? <laughs> and yeah, that's just a, a thing that I find very curious and absurd. Uh, about the feelings, I would say the feeling that most, that I feel the most, and also that mostly motivate my work is anger. And uh, recently thinking about it and talking to a friend from Uruguay, we were talking about uh, how at some point coming from Latin America, you learn to take anger as a fuel to do stuff. Like, of course, I also get depressed or tired at some point from so much anger. But there is something, it's something that the Zapatistas say. They have a festival called Festival de la Digna Arabia, which means the, the entitled anger, let's say. That's the, the anger that you have the right to feel, no? And that can be productive somehow or reactive to the oppressions. And... Well, I think grief is also very frequent to the loss of humans and also non-humans. Like we had big fire in Amazon and we had the crazy president saying that the brigade that was trying to stop the fire was actually the one that caused it and actually put them in prison for a while until finally they could be released. Um, yeah, and also there were audios of people, land grabbers admitting, organizing fires. So it's like really absurd what's happening in Brazil. And I don't know, I think I oscillate between anger and despair. <laughs> and I think also part of this anger and despair is a consequence of the fake news, which in Brazil were a serious big deal now. I think not only in Brazil, also here with Corona, there is a whole, wave of fake news. And I think it's interesting to trace back the fake news somehow. I think you guys can tell me what you think, but in my mind, it makes me think of the first studies on climate change that were run by the oil companies because the scientists were like, oh, it looks like, yeah, it could be messed up in a few years. And then the oil companies also were like, okay, let's check that. And they hired great scientists, make a group inside their, their company to investigate it and then they conclude it was yeah it's really messed up and as a consequence of that knowledge instead of taking action they dismantle the group make a way that they don't speak and and they start investing in the same uh, sort of communication and advocates that worked for the tobacco industry which basically work on sustaining a doubt you know? and they also start funding other kind of scientists to to create a doubt so that's where the negationist movement comes from no the people that say it's not true it's uh, a sort of heritage from this practice and and now we see it in all directions in brazil like there are fake news and sometimes even based on scientific research like they get one thing of scientific research and from that they dismantle it and also there is a um, yeah crazy techniques <laughs> it's really impressive my father sends me stuff that i'm like i can't believe it and yeah i think i have i don't know how much time i spoke already because <laughs> i have a lot to say still so i don't know maybe i can stop and we continue in dialogue that sounds good <laughs> okay <laughs> Alini, so um, Tal, it's yours. You said like, it's really good that you speak as the last person as uh, you're going to address the apocalypse. So far we were building up this feeling of, you know, like grief, um, despair and anger. Um, yeah, where are we heading? 
<laughs> I'm asking you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Um, but thank you thank so you much God. for including me in today's conversation. And thank you to Framer Framed and Ben Choi for organizing this uh, series of discussions. Um, and thank you also to my fellow panelists for their thoughtful contributions. It's given me a lot to think about. Um, you know, I know there are plenty of nuanced feelings about the climate crisis and related challenges. Um, but I'd like to focus today, as Bina said, on something a little more dramatic. Uh, uh, and some of my work over the last few years has dealt with the notion of apocalypse, um, which is the theme that I'll focus on today. Um, so I'd like to start with three questions that I'll simply ask now, and maybe you can just answer the questions privately in your mind. Um, the first one is, uh, what will you do? What's your plan in the event of an apocalyptic cataclysm? one that affects the whole world and everyone around you. If you are among the survivors of this apocalypse, what will life look like for you five or 10 years afterwards? And then the last question, do you imagine uh, that this post-apocalyptic life would be enjoyable, would be an enjoyable life for you? Um, and I'll return to those questions later. I've asked those questions many, many times to many, many people. Um, and so just by way of introduction, I'm, I'm Tal Beery, and along with my partner, Eugenia Manuelian, um, I founded Eco Practicum in 2011. Yay. And Eco Practicum was a school for ecological justice that drew university students from throughout North America for an intensive hands-on um, engagement with the way that complex environmental issues were playing out in the New York City bioregion. Um, so my partner and I felt that the environmental and social issues we were facing were extremely urgent. Um, and that universities simply weren't educating students to engage fully and productively once they graduated. So passionate students would receive, let's say, a great deal of training in theory. Um, and once they left the bubble of the university, they would typically experience a period of disappointment and disillusionment when they attempted to, like, you know, join the job market and put theory into practice. So Eco Practicum had this praxis oriented pedagogical approach. Um, and, um, you know, for example, students would read texts about the ethics of eating meat, and then we would tour an active um, industrial scale beef processing plant, or they would learn about renewable energy and then build and test a solar array. Um, you know, we knew our program was working when participants would leave more confused um, and with more profound questions than when they arrived. Um, because in our experience, the world is confusing. You know, the path is never clear. Um, and the best you can do is be guided by better and better questions. I think art does a good job of doing that too. Um, you know, around 2014, one of uh, our participants asked me a question that's echoed in my mind all these years since. Um, basically, just paraphrasing, she said, you know, our environmental crises in the West seem uh, all to arise in part from a complex of attitudes and behaviors that are deeply embedded in our culture. So if that's the case, how do we change culture? Uh, and it's not a new question, and it certainly wasn't the first time that I'd considered it, but it, but, um, it did for the first time express to me the limits of the skills-based or activity-based approach to addressing ecological injustices. And for the first time, you know, um, and, 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 you know, before that I had been wrestling with merging my artistic practice and my practice as an educator. So this question coming from one of my program participants, it felt like permission to pursue the merger fully. And the following year, you know, a freak snowstorm uh, sparked a series of conversations between me and Catherine Despont, who had been the educational director of Pioneer Works, a large art center in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and we brought on two collaborators, artist Adam Stennett and my partner, Eugenia Manuelian. And the conversation centered on imagining how we might build a climate change survival cult for artists, um, one that inspired maybe a shift in attitudes and perhaps um, a new aesthetic movement. Uh, so our conversations lasted one year and increasingly began to focus on notions of survival, the apocalypse, and the cultural role of creative practice. Um, and the conversations led to the founding of School of Apocalypse, which was a radically horizontal educational platform that operated uh, between 2016 and 2019 in New York City, and has helped to inspire some similar projects in other places. You know, it, it's a truly powerful design for a public educational institution, but it's too much to get into here. I can share my um, if anyone wants to connect with me, you can see me online and we can talk another time. But um, 
you know, the apocalypse, the, the complete and final destruction of the world or somewhat like a less dramatic, uh, in, a, in a less dramatic fashion, fashion like some catastrophic, a catastrophic event of an awesome scale, um, you know, has been a fascination for me since my early 20s. Um, and uh, in fact, I spent a year in Amsterdam uh, learning 17th century Dutch so I could study golden age Dutch pamphlets about a Jewish apocalyptic cult. And that was in 2004. <laughs> um, and it was for a thesis that I was writing that was not about the apocalypse, but was actually about the Messiah. Um, and over time, it became clear to me that at least in the West, apocalyptic dread and messianic longing are fundamentally indistinguishable. Um, and I was seeing this trend pop up in 17th century Dutch uh, literature and other esch eschatological accounts. Um, but parts of this I felt very deeply within myself. You know, catastrophe brings with it the promise of redemption. And as much as I fear the end, I also desire it. And it, it was a troubling personal realization because I wasn't alone. You know, over the course of a year, School of Apocalypse facilitated a monthly series of conversations in an Airstream trailer that was parked in the garden of Pioneer Works. And it was very small and intimate and it was beautifully out, out, outfitted with seating and a wood burning stove uh, that we used uh, to keep warm in the winter. And each month we would sit there for six straight hours for a rolling conversation about the apocalypse. Uh, different people would come and go and the conversations would evolve and change. Um, and we would hold these during, um, you know, Pioneer Works' second Sundays, which was a big, big community wide event. So the art center was packed with people who weren't expecting to join in some sort of conversation about the apocalypse. So we did, it was, which was really important in gathering a broader set of perspectives. And one of my favorite ways to spark a conversation was to ask them the questions that I asked you in the beginning. What, what is your plan in the event of the apocalypse? And you know, the, the crazy thing is that most people rarely needed time to answer. Um, I think that may have been one of the most remarkable things that everyone seemed to have such a quick and easy answer for this. Maybe not everybody, but it was just remarkable how quickly they would respond as if they've been thinking about it forever and just waiting for someone to finally ask them. You know, I, I must have had this conversation with hundreds of people and, and patterns started to emerge in their responses. So people either, uh, they tended to be ocean people, you know, folks who wanted to, who believed that they would build sailboats and create large rafts or caravans in the oceans, or there were mountain people like me um, who imagined retreating to the mountains, possibly by a lake and building some sort of compound or village there. Um, you know, invariably, there was a vision of a simpler life, you know, a return to basics maybe. Uh, some people imagine needing to defend themselves from hordes of needy or greedy people. Some people imagine more peace and solidarity. Um, generally speaking, people tended to discuss their plans uh, excitedly. You know, um, eventually it started, uh, I started to ask a follow-up question. Do you imagine, the one I asked you, do you imagine this, post this post-apocalyptic life would be enjoyable? Um, or, you know, I'd also ask, even without an apocalypse, is this the way you'd want to live? Um, and more often than not, the answer was yes. Um, it seemed to me that people wanted to live simpler, more grounded lives, um, but that that was impossible to achieve within the current order, uh, within the obligations demanded of us, uh, within the systems that govern us. You know, the apocalypse was this opportunity to start over. It was permission to live lives that people wanted to live. And while most people acknowledged the pain and suffering, you know, the uncertainty and the loss, um, you know, many said, uh, and, and many said, by the way, that they would rather not survive the apocalypse. Um, those that did think that they would survive, they spoke excitedly about their plans for leaving cities and hunting and fishing for their meat, you know. And also, I should pause for a moment just to say that, uh, you know, people from communities of color, indigenous communities, LGBTQ communities, disability communities, um, and other groups that typically feel under threat from state sanctioned violence, they often offered much more skeptical answers to these questions. Um, and honestly, I do not have a clear perspective on this yet, and I'm still very much in the middle of exploring it. And so I'll leave it for now, but, um, but definitely it's something that I want to return to. Um, uh, it wasn't everybody, but it certainly was a theme within the series of, of responses that I received. So in fact, it might, it might be that this preoccupation with apocalypse is a privileged uh, position to take. Um, but as many of you, as you know, uh, uh, the word apocalypse comes from the Greek to uncover or to reveal. And typically the a catastrophic apocalypse was part of some larger revelation, either of humanity's place in the grand scheme of things or of God, God's larger plan for us. 
And I believe that the apocalypse in our imagination is also revelatory of deep personal desires and visions of lives unimpeded by the weight of history or of, uh, by oppressive systems of control. And by removing those restrictions, the apocalypse offers an interface, a kind of mirror that reflects our fantasies back to us, whether a communalist or hyper-masculinist or et cetera. So in the very short time I have left, I just wanna return to a comment I made earlier about the connection between apocalyptic dread and messianic longing. So from all my study and um, all these conversations and also experiencing these feelings myself, um, I believe that people tend to enjoy the idea of living in the end times and that living in the end confers upon their lives some sort of morbid significance, one that spares them the pain of not knowing and never experiencing the human story as it unfolds without them for many generations. You know, and I say they and them because while I, I have also felt this apocalyptic dread and desire myself in the past, I, I don't really feel that way anymore. My feelings are much more ambivalent. Um, apocalypses of one kind or another are happening constantly. The indigenous peoples on my continent experienced it. I'm in North America, experienced an apocalypse 500 years ago. Um, my grandparents and their families experienced a sort of apocalypse in the Nazi camps. Uh, the fires in California today seem apocalyptic. In New York, I was very close to the World Trade Center attack when it happened. I was in the middle of Superstorm Sandy and Hurricane Irene, and all of them seemed like apocalypses at the time. Um, so, you know, in my opinion, to dread the collapse or disruption brought about by climate change is to indulge in a heroic notion. Um, and I don't think we need heroes today. Um, I think we need something else. I think th the apocalypse is heroic in that it offers a dramatic ending some sort of unmistakable punctuation or grand revelation that's otherwise a story, a grand revelation to a story um, that is otherwise simply ongoing. You know, the apocalyptic story follows a linear or progressive narrative arc. Um, it presupposes a human triumph of one kind or another. And um, whether our fantasies are techno-utopian, hyper-masculinist, or, or perhaps uh, mutualistic and earth-honoring, the notion of apocalypse places human life, human experience, and human capacity for transformation on a pedestal. And I don't think we need fantasies of impending doom to motivate climate action. I, I don't think we need heroes. Um, we need a new unheroic sort of story. And I take my cues from, uh, um, there's a 1986 essay um, by the great science fiction writer Ursula Le Guin called The Carrier Bag Theory of Fiction that I, I recommend to anybody to read. Um, um, like she recommends, I think we need stories that put humans where they belong. So thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, Carl, uh, Alini, Ada, and Clementine. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's interesting that like, uh, first three speakers didn't really address and talk about the works they do, but more the emotional journey. And then we uh, arrive at the <laughs> uh, School of Apocalypse. But again, it was less about how school operates, but more about this kind of, what does this sense or feeling of apocalypse does, um, what we can do about. And um, uh, I definitely would like to, I would like to check the temperature of the room <laughs> among us uh, on the panel, but also uh, in the chat room, <laughs> who's now listening and attending to this room. Uh, so why like uh, waiting for hearing from you, all of you, uh, I, uh, yeah, like to comment on um, the so-called this like negative feelings <laughs> that we all address uh, in order to discern and and draw imaginary that we we need. So like uh, with apocalypse or apocalyptic feeling. Uh, what is interesting or curious and and uh, and also I feel cautious is that the imaginary it draws 
is much learned from um, the cinema. <laughs> but then uh, other feelings that we were addressing, uh, mourning or grieving, feeling despair, um, uh, I don't have. I don't have this uh, image <laughs> uh, or like, um, yeah, the imaginary uh, that circulated. So maybe there, there, there is in fact, like rather lack of such imaginary, which could be discernible from apocalyptic imaginary. Because I don't know whether actually also in apocalyptic imaginary, what kind of feelings are attached to. And the other way to ask is that this, um, uh, in these feelings of uh, sadness and yeah, grief and anger, what kind of imaginary actually being uh, forged or conjured? And I'm thinking of actually also image uh, uh, Clementine you are creating, you know, like you rarely buy materials. You, how do you call it? Like foraging material, <laughs> uh, um, something from like trash bins or just yeah. left over after um, a, a gathering. And then uh, they make such a kind of precarious, uh, construction uh, or kind of like, um, yeah, little sad, sweet, <laughs> uh, a fragile uh, shelter. Um, so I'm also thinking whether that's the, another imaginary that we could draw on uh, to accommodate uh, these uh, feelings. Um, anyone wants to respond to this? <laughs> I think um, I find this concept of apocalypse incredibly challenging from a perspective of a person who has lived through a life in many instances that one might call an apocalypse, you know, like personal private experiences to do with the way in which I'm read in society or the uh, experiences of violence that have been put onto me. Um, and so this, this notion of um, morbid significance or uncovering that needs to come with some sort of kind of masculinist end point, I find to be incredibly um, well, it, it, for me, it's not particularly relevant. I think apocalypse is happening, as you say, constantly to, but also um, uh, I, I, I guess I, I feel reluctant to engage. <laughs> I, I guess I, these, these the, my artwork, Bina, that you mention, uh, working with small, uh, working with materials that have been gleaned from my uh, everyday interactions, found on the ground, gifted to me at kind of certain moments uh, that kind of I, I like to see as kind of bridges within the relationships and also kind of uh, windows onto broader relationships, making relationships with materials. This is its own kind of world building. And yeah, that sounds like very uh, naive, but I, I guess it's, it's its own way of like locating delight, for instance, in the present day, in the face of feeling like shit in the present day, actually. And like maybe the apocalypse isn't uh, world ending in the sense I, I, I still, I live very comfortably. Um, but I think there's like um, I, I guess I'm 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 interested to speak about kind of yeah the the textures of the feelings actually rather than being guided by a cinematic image of uh, what it is to experience extreme feeling, which for me is I mean I, I can talk about extreme feeling you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just I want to clarify that I, I I think there's a very big distinction between the grand narratives that this kind of um, that like climate collapse mm -hmm. uh, 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 inspires and these far more what you described as a personal apocalypse that I think are very real and um, 
And I think there's a lot more power, in fact, in the more nuanced uh, grief and the you know, feelings that people have. Um, uh, like I think that focusing on our personal experiences is in fact uh, a far more powerful way of engaging um, with, uh, with uh, you know, the, the, the crisis, these, this big decision point that we're facing now. And, um, and I think too, that the apocalypse isn't only a cinematic uh, reality or phenomenon right now. It's, it's, it became cinematic because it's ever present. I think that, I think that you know, there've been um, various uh, articles and, and papers that have circulated in recent years that have um, truly you know, reinforced this um, uh, notion of climate collapse and ecological collapse and co civilizational collapse and the kind of imminence of it is ever is very present for for many people, and so I think it's still very it's, it's a it's a present phenomenon and it exists very much for some people in their it affects their their personal realities. Um, so hopefully that's that's just a clarification of the position that where I think this apocalyptic imaginary is. I don't think, in fact, I don't want to spend too much time thinking about it because I think actually a lot of what a lot of what the rest uh, the rest of our panelists were bringing up these far more personal experiences. Um, I would love to dis dis disassociate the the apocalyptic grand narrative with these far more personal um, experiences and just throw that a grand narrative out. That's just the personal. Um, Desire. Yeah, I actually, I uh, I don't mean uh, at all there is no apocalypse, but it's more about what that notion uh, brings in and also how often that's attached to this notion of survivor after apocalypse. Um, so like my proposal is to maybe bring more other vocabularies of our experience and feeling with the cri uh, climate crisis. And, and also as we are, are speaking from the field of art and we or our artists uh, or organizers here, um, uh, so I propose to uh, draw and introduce, present other imaginary, you know, like, so, uh, yes, apocalypse or the end of a world is near, but then there is this image of, you know, like which I, I read in between, uh, I read from this book, The Ends of the World by uh, Deborah Danovsky and uh, Eduardo Viveiro de Castro, that this uh, Yanomami uh, a group uh, has this image of uh, shamans and holding up the sky that is falling. And I learned from a friend lately, there's also a book called The Falling Sky, which is a uh, account of the Yanomami shaman's uh, vision and experience. So uh, there is, I think, a subtle uh, difference uh, between imagining the apocalypse or how, how, uh, how we imagine the, the closeness to uh, the apocalypse or apocalypse had, had, had happened um, and what kind of like, uh, how, how do we prevent for another apocalypse coming rather than thinking uh, survivor of the few selective after. Um, I'd like to say a few things. Uh, first, uh, to tell, it was very interesting that while you were thinking, I was thinking about the carrier bag all the time. And it's uh, actually, I have a quote, but also again, that I would like to share today also. Um, yeah, and I think the reason why unprivileged people don't have the same response would maybe be because we are aware that to survive in precarious situation, you need a collective. So also one of the feelings besides despair, and et cetera, there is also some hope that comes out of solidarity. Uh, maybe I can talk about how it was in, in the Caribbean. I remember New Orleans was a very important example of solidarity among the community since the state was never, was a bit too late to send help to black people. Uh, and in Brazil, for example, with um, the genocide, genocidal president and also governor of Rio that actually sends, sends policemen to the favelas during pandemic and we had murder of kids as usual. 
uh, by lost shots, that's how they call it. And, and the favelas are organizing themselves to, to get food, to share cleaning products, to share masks, to try to organize the people that are not in the street. So there is um, the anger and the grief, but there's also some hope that comes out of solidarity. But I would be naive to think that that's enough because that's how we've been surviving since ever, you know, organizing communities and surviving. So I think maybe that has to do with the idea, the, the different perspectives on the idea of apocalypse. I think a privileged person can project themselves as a hero in a way, as someone that survives and can make a sailboat and blah, blah, blah. And if you are from a poor community, you know you depend on more people, you need more arms, you need more, like, it's, of course, I'm speculating here, I'm not doing your research, but I think that could be a, a, a possibility, a possible answer. And I think that's also what Ursula is talking in her text, when she says that heroism is botulism, because heroism, uh, the hero, he kind of makes everybody around him unimportant you know to to for the for the narrative to develop and as someone from a less privileged condition i'm very aware that i can do anything myself alone and yeah also talking about hope trying to get some hope here i was actually it's yeah it's the double bind thing that the climate change plus the corona situation i'm sorry my kids are too loud is it fine you can hear, okay. Uh, the other feeling is loneliness, you know? <laughs> is Bina there? Yeah. It's the other feeling is loneliness because we got isolated, the ones that have the privilege to get isolated. And, and this isolation, we had to find ways to like get things through the mail, talk to people via internet. And I think that that has two consequences. One is really bad, which is um, people learn to live in this condition of loneliness, sadness, depression, anxiety, and they fear so much the outside world that they kind of adapt to the situation, the privileged ones that can, like start only buying from the internet, avoid the agglomerations, avoid going outside. and. And that in a way would be good for the machine, no? Like you continue working from your house, you continue consuming from your house, that's great. And the hopeful um, feeling, like, or the hopeful other side of the coin that could happen is that people realize how they need each other, how they need contact, how they need exchange. And and maybe after lockdown, start engaging more in collective actions, like collective gardening. Uh, I keep, here it's called Solavi, when you get food from the farmers and then you kind of create a community around it. You have to go there, organize the stuff, get the stuff. So all this sort of self-organized, more anarchist aligned movements. Because also something that I was going to say about an answer to grief, when the awakening happens to privileged people, um, the grief, instead of turning into a political collective response, which I think is what we need, because I'll see it Russell again. I'll post Russell again after, because well, the world was created like that by humans, you no? Know? So it's, it has to be possible to change it, but it's, it's too overwhelming and tiring and desperation comes all the time. So it's really hard to do it. And what people who have privilege to do it often turn their consumerism into a green consumerism. Like I'll buy organic, I'll buy uh, fake meat, I'll, I don't know, use a super fashion backpack, but it's made of coconut fiber, you know, it's, and I don't think that these are like not, not worthy of value. I think it's also attempts, but I think they're way less effective in the way that they keep the machine running. 
So you, you create one, one more kind of consumerism, the green consumerism, and people feel less guilty about the climate change. Like I'm not contributing, I, I'm buying bio, I'm doing this and that, that. But actually the consequence of this little consumers, consumers change, uh, the impact is like less than 3%. So it's way more, way more about how you feel about it than actually how it happens. And often also happens that these divide people in the sense that uh, people decide to judge each other based on their consumer choices. And often they ignore that their consumer choices are directly connected to their privilege. They can choose what to buy and not everybody can choose what to buy. And what I was going to quote by Legan is that she says, um, she said, we live in, a, in capitalism. Its power seems inescapable, but then so did the divine right of kings. Any human power can be resisted and changed by human beings. Resistance and change often come, resistance and change often begin in art. So that's the, I think that's the idea of imaginary that you were talking about, or you were asking, you know? Uh, and I think that's kind of what I try to do with my work, to engage in other uh, understandings of the world, such as the fall of the sky by the Yanomami. I'm very happy you quoted Eduardo and Deborah. <laughs> and yeah, and I'm very close to this um, thinking. And that's where the ontological conflict comes from the description of my work. Because it's really like these other words, other worlds that already resisted the apocalypse and they're they're existing now, like people are now living that way. And you don't kind of you don't have to wait for the end of the, the end of the world of the apocalypse to change it. But it feels so hard to change it. And it's also something that Ayuton Krenaki, which is also an indigenous leader from Brazil, a thinker, and he has some books released recently. And he says in one interview, he says, I don't know why people wait so long for the end of the world. Let's end this world already and start another one. So, yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> uh, let's start now because <laughs> there was a one question that could be relevant uh, from Ashley. So she was saying, could you speak more about the personification or assigning of temperament to storms and to nature? Uh, especially brought by uh, Ada and Alini. So uh, how that may feature in your work or understanding of climate crisis. So I think key word is kind of per, like how you relate to this uh, like natural phenomena. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so I guess in my, uh, yeah, I'll talk about, I'll talk more about hurricanes. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was having interesting conversations with um, my friend Ark, who was also part of this new work. Um, they're also from Barbados. Um, and they, they're currently studying uh, in the States. Um, and yeah, we were having yeah difficult conversations about like, um, so they are a writer and uh, they're trying to write about like the experience of hurricanes, but they're very much against this idea of yeah personification or human humanizing um, because it and also moralizing um, uh, phenomenon such as hurricanes. Um, and I guess I, for myself, I, I find that a bit, I find that difficult um, and complicated, um, which is why it's easier for me to see the hurricane as something that belongs in the region or that is expected seasonally, um, is, is not a, like, um, a stranger, um, but rather is, that is something that, yeah, belongs to the fabric of the region. Um, and for me, it's, it's less, it's less to do with, um, yeah, seeing it as, um, 
as this evil thing that's destroying us um and more so the fact that there are like <laughs> there are people in the world there are companies in the world um that are making decisions that very much know what they are doing to us to our landscapes um to our hurricanes um and therefore yeah to our livelihoods um they know what they're doing and they have decided already that they are not going to change um and and for me it's like yeah the the to relate to a hurricane to see it as 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 part of where i come from or um uh, part of that social fabric um is to more so have a problem with someone else for lack of a better word fucking up that dynamic <laughs> um and yeah having a lot of feelings about that <laughs> as well um because it is um a disruption i guess of of an order um uh which we have we don't have very much uh um say in like how that actually how that disruption uh goes or functions um i made uh like during uh the passage of hurricane dorian i was uh, i was in the in the beginnings of making a, f a film um called the whole world is turning um and it's basically about like the arrival of of a hurricane um on a beach uh, and there's like a community of like I guess lovers or loved ones, um, yeah, being visited by this hurricane. Um, for like visual aid, I work with masquerade and costuming, um, and so it was four performers on a beach, and then the hurricane was also uh, embodied by a person in masquerade. Um, but uh, I guess in the in part of the film like uh like the hurricane arrives there's this like movement pro process this like kind of dance um which leaves the for uh the the community devastated or like collapsed um and then there's this moment um where the community is kind of speaking to uh the arrival of the hurricane uh, referring to the hurricane as sis or sister um like I think it's important to take into account this familiarity um, because it's, um, yeah, because it, it it's not. I don't want to uh, resign myself to thinking like, um, like oh, this year's hurricane was terrible. Like how could how could it do that to us? Um, it makes perfect sense how it could do that to us because of um, the conditions being there as as instituted by the decisions of other people um other companies whatever um uh like it, the conditions are there and that's why this devastation makes perfect sense it doesn't mean i have words for it but but it's a kind of complicated feeling like um to know that this destabilizing thing makes perfect sense <laughs> as to why it's happening um but yeah, like in the in this in the community speaking to the hurricane in the film, it's very much like yeah, having this familiar tone, saying like you don't know how much you've changed, sis, but we can't like we can't grapple with you anymore, um, and you're completely overwhelming us, and and you don't even know it, um, like this is happening to you, this is happening to us, and there's nothing we can do about it, um, you know in a way like sort of speaking to what uh Eleni was saying of like like a, we can't make small decisions or take small steps and expect things to get better um there's a lot of like giant systemic change in other parts of the world that needs to happen before we can face our hurricanes again um and that's tough <laughs> um i I guess I also wanted to to speak in a, a different way to to respond to something that you said, Bina, about yeah the lack a lack of an imaginary for grief or mourning, 
Um, and I wanted to tell another story, I guess. Um, uh, this is, I guess, more in terms of time, it was related to um, uh, the sort of first, the beginnings of quarantine uh, amid the pandemic. Um, and yeah, like, I guess in that moment, it was very much like, yeah, there's more grief here. Here it is, grief again, um, or still happening. Um, kind of off of the back of like complicated feelings around climate crisis and hurricanes <laughs> like um and for me it's like this like, ongoing layering of intersecting experiences of crisis after crisis after crisis um but yeah in the beginning in the beginnings of quarantine like i was having a lot of difficulty sort of not making sense of but like i guess making space for grief um like in a way to s sit in it without feeling um like i couldn't do anything um and so like something that I, I would do as a child um or since childhood uh which helps me to think about grief and loss or helps me to yeah to make space for it to live with it um was building sandcastles um and so i would uh there's actually a, a river beach here called in rotterdam called quarantine beach <laughs> um which i i would go to um like every couple of days of days or so um to build sand castles from like obviously the sand that was there but also like uh, any debris um or um driftwood or materials that had washed up um, essentially. Um, and I've, I've had a conversation with Clem about this before, like also, um, cause I, I think when we first met and I first sort of saw Clem's work that it, it made me think of sandcastles, <laughs> um, also to speak to the kind of precarity, um, of these things and this like, yeah, you build a sandcastle knowing that it will be lost eventually. Um, knowing that it won't survive the night or the high tide. Um, and so for me, that was very much like, yeah, I guess it became more of a, like a deliberate practice of, yeah, making space for grief, making space for mourning, imagining that, uh, conjuring it, I guess, as well. Um, because once you like leave something on the beach that is kind of, conjuring or anticipating its loss um yeah so i just want i just wanted to speak to that um in terms of like thinking of like yeah this imaginary potential imaginaries for grief and mourning um yeah on other i i'm very happy to hear that you've been working on grief because I think one of the reasons that we don't have imaginary about griefing is because we are not allowed to. And, and the system that we live, we're supposed to produce even in a pandemic time, you know? And talking about it and talking about the Yanomami people, we had recently a situation that some kids and some young people went to a hospital to get treatment and they passed away and the hospital didn't want to give back the bodies. And of course, the Yanomami people have their own way of mourning. So that's to say how the system does not allow other ways of being, not even other ways of grieving. It was a big struggle to get the bodies because of the contamination and et cetera. But that's to say that uh, some feelings, they kind of got lost somehow. They, not that they got lost, they got, they lost their, the right to be there somehow. You kind of have to hide it and swallow it and move on. And I'm happy to hear that you're working on that because I think it's imaginary that has to be uh, worked on and we have to recreate it somehow to, to get it back. And about the personification of forces of nature, 
Um, well, <laughs> from an Afro-Brazilian religious point of view, the forces of nature are, are our gods, they're our orishas. So in a way you can say that it's kind of personified. I wouldn't say personified, but maybe that's a way to understand it. And we respect them and we honor them and worship them. And that's one way to relate it. And also of course, respect them. And also the indigenous peoples and riverines and quilombolas, which are uh, communities organized from ex-slave people who flee and organized. And their like their religion is very strong, sometimes mixed with Christianism. And for the indigenous people in River Rains, um, many forces of nature and bodies of nature are somehow personified. And I think the difference here is that maybe when 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 in the Western culture nature is personified is in the sense of control, maybe like Hurricane Katrina, I'm giving it a name so I can give the data on it. It will be, I don't know how much speed per hour, you should prepare in this way, blah, blah, blah. And for example, the work I presented in Sharjah Biennial was about a river that um, the government wants to dam. And for the local communities, it's, it's unthinkable. It's it's a cosmological break. Like the, the river is not just a river and inside the river there are enchanted beings that teach you how to relate to the forest, that teach you how to respect the river, that teach you how to get healing from the plants in the forest. And this is a very profound relation that they have to nature and you can call it personification of the river. Maybe it's a snake, but in a way it's respected as a person. Somehow I think for, for for Western perspective, to respect anything, it has to be considered a subject. And at the same time, I heard one, one artist talking about it. I can't remember his name, but it was a very good point. He said, look, uh, my people, he was also black. He said, my people have been trying for a long time to be recognized as people. And by law we are, and not much have changed. We're still not being treated as people. So I'm not so sure if for the Western gaze, personifying forces of nature will change their behavior in relation to it because it did not change their behavior to indigenous and black people. So I think it's a broader change. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I guess every, everything these days need uh, nuance. <laughs> yeah, so yeah like personification but through what kind of person <laughs> or what image of um, person or uh, people um, so while listening to i was thinking of also emotional fear uh, like or panic which uh, greta <laughs> emphasized it uh, emphasized uh, but um what I was uh, thinking is that we need to also like uh, analyze, undo uh, different kinds of fear. So one fear is really like fear uh, to create object, to see, uh, to objectify uh, and to make that object controllable or to be, you know, like be away, separated, separated. And other is fear that you give all or, or respect. So uh, you live with uh, in, um, yeah, in, in conversation, <laughs> in negotiation. Um, uh, and so, so building uh, certain intimate uh, like relationship, which also, uh, yeah, make me think of the works by, uh, yeah. Clementine and Ada, because Ada, you also emphasize how you, um, uh, yeah, I've been realizing the importance of this kind of inter intimate relationship. And the later also, Alina, you also said this kind of collectivity, um, uh, solidarity is like necessity uh, for um, now. And, but that's also like base for, um, 
acting or uh, preventing the otherwise near apocalypse. Um, yeah, so we have uh, five minutes left. And my proposal is what if that we end with the last word from each person? <laughs> yeah. So shall we do order like the other way around? So we now start with Tao. <laughs> New beginning. <laughs> doesn't okay. feel, that doesn't feel fair though, because then I get the first and the last word as a panel person. It's not right. <laughs> okay, so we let's mix it. <laughs> so, <laughs> but let's I, begin. I, 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 can, and sorry, then I, I can start because I have something Thank to you. say that might that might need follow up from other people. Mm -hmm. um, I'd love some help uh, because I realized in this conversation, maybe I've known it for a long time, but I hadn't truly faced it mm -hmm. that I don't know how I feel anymore about anything about, about the world. I feel a bit lost. Um, my feelings aren't clear to me. They, they haven't been for some time. I've been raising young children and I've been working so hard. I've been so productive. <laughs> and I don't know how I feel anymore. And I don't have any space for grief. There's no space for grief in my life. I can't let it, I can't let it, I can't give it any space. And I would like some. There's something that has to move there. Thank you for sharing. We will get back to you after yeah, this conversation. Um, who would like to follow up? I I can I can follow. Uh, mm. Yeah, I, I think through this conversation, something that keeps returning to me and it feels like in the scheme of all the things that we've discussed and the richness of everything that we've discussed, it feels small. But for me, it's been, you know, uh, something very like guiding to work th uh, for me. And that's just uh, my material practice, actually, my practice in the studio of making small things and being intimate with um, small things that may be socially charged or remind me of a thing or expand or speak to another thing. And I was thinking of this when Ada mentioned the sandcastles and our conversations around uh, yeah, and this this idea of working through grief or working through a feeling, and it feels, um, yeah, I mean, incredibly grounding and meditative to be able to work with the hands. To uh, it's not necessarily like kind of cognitive or active processing of a complicated feeling, but it's a bodily thing, um, just as you know, something as simple as walking around the block might be uh and I guess I uh yeah I mean it's come up also how how difficult it is when talking about um climate crisis to put words I certainly feel very complicated in like foregrounding my feelings around climate crisis um but I think just this action or this small gesture of like world making and the intimate scale, uh, you know, this tiny little precarious uh, uh, images or moments uh, for me uh, somehow like carry that complexity of emotion. Um, yeah, I just wanted to say that. Okay, I'll give it a try. <laughs> um, I think putting the two things together, what Tao shared, thank you for your honesty and openness to us. And what Glenn said, um, I think something that often happens from the Western white gaze is that they think we have a lot of rituals, you know? 
like um, the indigenous people have this morning ritual, this Afro-Brazilian people, they have this um, party for the goddess of the ocean ritual. And it's important to realize that every culture has its rituals. And it's really serious, psychologically speaking, for the Western uh, hegemonic way of life, that abandoning certain, certain rituals have consequences on people's lives and on people's mental health. And, and that's why I was saying that's so important that Ada is working on creating a grief process or artwork or mourning, ways of mourning. And I think that it is really not easy at all to fit these rituals to our daily life in capitalism, but they are important for like mental health. And, and um, like I said, I kind of, kind of feed from anger, but also sometimes I feel paralyzed and depressed. And these moments are equally important because if I don't stop at some point, then maybe I won't resist any longer. So, so yeah, in a way, I think also making art is somehow a kind of ritual and, and it maybe is a small gesture or it's a small gesture for sure, but also sometimes you can engage more people and, and support other existences. That's what I try to do, but not always possible. But yeah, it's kind of this, I, I like to think about it as a counter spell, but yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I think what I want to, I just wanted to talk about this because of also what Tao shared and I totally understand that it feels like you don't have space for this in your, in your life, but yeah, there are certain things that they are very important also as an individual uh, to, to take the decision to to deal with these emotions and and they usually also help you clear your mind or clear your focus and understand where you want to go or yeah how you feel for example yeah <laughs> i think that's it um yeah like I guess around um, making space for grief um, in the way that I've been phrasing it uh, like um, is always something like taking the time we don't have to grief because <laughs> um, like in this sort of ongoing layering of crisis after crisis after crisis, um, the ongoing loss, um, the ongoing extinctions. Um, uh, yeah, I think for me, like, um, the least that I could try and do was to make, yeah, to make space for grief, not only for myself, but uh, for, for other people, um, at the very least, um, the people closest to me. <laughs> um, especially for those of us living lives um, which we definitely feel like they're not going to be grieved if if we've lost them um, and then like yeah those lives already lost those bodies already disappeared um, that couldn't get their moment to be grieved um, in a way that was meaningful um, yeah so i i, I remember um there's a quote by um, uh, Kai, Kai Miller, um, a Jamaican writer, um, who like writes extensively about grief or like grief situ uh, features or situates itself into their work, uh, his work quite a lot. Um, but it's something about um, as a writer, he feels like like grief is something inside of us um, and I'm trying to 
uh, I'm paraphrasing paraphrasing him terribly, by the way, but like, um, like grief is something inside of us, um, and he feels that it's his responsibility as a writer to, um, to rather than it to be inhabiting us, um, for us to inhabit it, to be in the space of grief, to make space for grief, uh, to make a grief space, um, and. I guess that kind of spirit, like I'd like to hold on to, um, as well as like, um, like when I first read him uh, saying that, it also reminded me of um, Audre Lorde saying, um, and I'm paraphrasing her, <laughs> um, but something like there must be a way, um, instead of like, like without resigning ourselves to it, like uh, finding ways to to live with death. Um, and I think, yeah, these are the kinds of voices which are like, that I try to keep with me, um, in, in making work, but also like living in the, in all these sort of complicated crisis queered moments. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, um, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, I I didn't imagine that we would end with uh, talking about grief. <laughs> um, um, yeah, I, I there are a lot to reflect and and say about this. But one thing that I uh, like to add, uh, especially thinking of uh, those who may have a question about grief and its political agency. Um, uh, for me, like grief also gives space of love in the world. Otherwise, there are so much like toxic, toxicness or toxicity <laughs> and the antagonism and, and hate. And um, this form of love also is something that we, um, yeah, can give us power to traverse and, and connect. So all the love for you <laughs> and uh, yeah, thank you so much. And also thank you very much for Sophia and Ashley and John, John, John uh, who was uh, setting up the, the technical stuff and everyone who stay in listening and sharing the space. So bye-bye. <laughs>